Hello friends. In this video we're going to look at a Baldwin Orgasonic model 54A that I picked up at a thrift store. This is a vintage organ that has two amplifiers in it. I picked it up for $25. And to start off with I'll show you some pictures that uh, I took while inside the thrift store while I was still trying to figure out whether to buy it or not. Uh, one of the problems with this is it's so large and heavy that you have to consider whether you want to mess with it at all. But the fact that it has a tube amplifier in it with some tubes that I knew had some value meant that uh, it was going to be worth salvaging, at least from a monetary standpoint. The fact is, it probably wasn't worth my time to do, but it's something I like to do, so uh, that's what I did. So we'll go through this step by step in the process I went through of testing it out and evaluating what its future might be. I just brought home this brand new 1960s vintage Baldwin Orgasonic. Still in the van. This is extremely heavy. Can't move it by myself, but my son's coming home tomorrow to help from college. Let's go around and take a look at the back real quick. Although part of the back panel is broken off, it basically looks good. I've peeked through the holes. I'm going to plug it in and try it out. Okay, we'll try it here in three, two, one. And comes to life. See if the tubes glow on the back. Terrible grinding sound. That might be the built-in Leslie speaker. We'll turn that off. Okay, this is the switch for the built-in Leslie speaker. It's warmed up a little bit. Let's see if anything comes out. Try the bass pedals. Leslie feature doesn't sound good, but we'll live with that for now. Now this appears to be the switch to the Leslie motor. Make that go away. This sounds like a reverb tank that's having some problems. Okay, so we'll call that a success so far. So it looks like this has some problems to be solved, although I was planning on scrapping it out. So we'll do one of those two things at some point. This is enough to get us started for the in the van test. Here's the van. And we'll go from there. So to get an initial idea of whether this is working beyond the sound test, I'm going to turn it on and look at our watts. As it warms up, the first number I saw here was 138. We're down to about 100 watts, 1020. Let's turn on the Leslie fan, or Leslie motor. 
Well, let's add 70 watts to it. It may also turn on an amplifier that goes with it. So we'll just leave that off for now. It's like, well, we may have settled in on 158 watts after warming up. So this organ has quite a few minor problems. These aren't valuable uh, as organs. They're basically obsolete as a musical instrument. This one I think dates from probably the early 60s, about 50 years old. It's worth kind of zero as an organ almost. Uh, you know, if I were to take the cost of my time repairing it or even pay somebody that would be way more than it's worth uh, I got it for $25 at the thrift store and it had been 50 so it was marked down things like this are typically so heavy it's almost like moving a piano where even the cost of moving it or the trouble of moving it is kind of more than it's worth I think there's about $600 worth of parts inside here and this is something that's kind of worth more dead than alive. It's literally worth less than the value of its own parts. So I can put a little bit of labor into tearing apart the major components, maybe fixing some things that are basic electronics, and then, uh, you know, that kind of makes it worth my time. We can sell the pieces on eBay or I can use them in other projects. Well, here it is after we got it out of the van. My son and I, with the help of my wife, uh, rustled it out. We had to put it uh, on a reinforced board and kind of slide it down. It only had to go about a few inches down, maybe eight inches down from the van to the floor, but getting it out of the van and onto the garage floor is quite an endeavor. Now I've tried this out a little bit more and found that the problems that it has are more severe than I thought. We'll turn it on here. I'm going to turn off the, the Leslie motor after it starts up here. Takes a minute to warm up. So the upper keyboard seems to work okay. I haven't really been able to get different sounds out of it. Every sound sounds the same. And the lower manual is comes through and works but it's very weak so I don't know if it has a separate preamp or something that needs tube replacement or what there's some sort of feedback Here I'm on the secondary setting. More feedback. It's interesting. Turn on the rotary. So this at least has one motor in it for the Leslie effect, which is in this area down here. We're going to take a look at the uh, underneath front of it. So here's a look at the underneath. We've got our traditional one octave of pedals for this type of spinet organ. This is Leslie 
area. You can see, you may not be able to see through there, but there's what's called a cheese grater, which is a spinning wheel with a speaker that points down this way and ultimately the sound comes out through these holes. So I've got one speaker here, one speaker here, two large speakers look like about 10 inches. We'll shoot the underside. This is just kind of a flimsy plastic type covering for maybe the underside of the switches. Um, the cabinet on this is kind of scratched up, has a few severe flaws. Um, this one here, I don't know if somebody decided to chew it or what, but um, so putting all the problems this has together, it really is going to turn into a parts piece. I kind of thought that maybe there was some hope of saving it, but that really isn't going to be worth worth it. This doesn't have any monetary value. This organ of is not valued by the organ people like the Hammonds are. It's an obsolete technology. It may have been a nice piece of furniture in its day, but that's long ago. So I'm going to proceed with a plan to scrap this thing. Now here's an interesting feature of this organ that you don't see on the other two that I've got, which is a Hammond and a Lowry. The music desk comes down, which isn't too unusual. But this whole top lid lifts off. And why is that? Well, it's kind of hard to see right now, but there's a set of tuning adjustments in this. I've counted up a total of 12 of them. There's also this potentiometer over here on the side for something. So I'm not sure what the time base is that this uses. The Hammond organ uses basically the 60 cycle as its time base reference. And the Lowry uses probably a crystal. I haven't got that's from the 70s and uses some integrated circuits. So I'm guessing it's based on a crystal reference frequency. But this one may just use some sort of tuned LC, and that's probably why this needs to have tuning accessible. This is really pretty similar to how you tune a piano as far as opening the lid and then adjusting what's inside. We also have the back that's fairly easy to pull off. Well, I've been wanting to take the back off of this thing and see what all is inside. I've peeked through the holes already, taken a few pictures, and looked at things online, but I don't completely know what's going on there yet. We'll find out shortly. Here's the big unveiling. Ta da! Oh, that's good. We have some circuit diagrams and other information. Which I guess it's not diagrams, it's just information. That was customary in these days when these things were made. Here's the big amplifier where all the uh, weight comes from. We've got three large transformers. Those have got these two large uh, 10 or 12 inch speakers. This I knew on the side. This has four 12AX7 tubes, which I know are worth about five bucks a piece if they're in good order used on eBay. This is probably the reverb tank. I'm not sure. Down here we've got the cheese wheel that goes with the Leslie effect. That spins. And there's a speaker facing down from the top. And you can see that the sound kind of gets out, or at least the airflow through this metal uh, grill here, 
with a cloth girl on the front. Got more screws to take off here to see another section of the, the Lowry mechanism. Here we've got a lot of things that we could see from the top with the lid open. There's these 12 tuners right here for example. I think I assume they have 12 of them, one for each of the 12 semitones in a standard tuning. So I'll take some of these other things off and we'll see what's underneath. Here's something I've never seen before. This is a wing nut with an end cap nut on top of it, which kind of defeats the purpose of a wing nut because you need a tool to uh, run it. But I just realized as I took this off, this might be the famed plate reverb. So maybe the end cap nut is to keep it nominally on and the wing nut is to adjust the tension for whatever amount of reverb you want. That would be cool. I've always wanted a plate reverb. Now I happen to have this leaf blower right here. I have a lot of dust right here and I have a garage right here. So, I'm not going to avoid the temptation. Now, well, here's a little tip I didn't used to know. This type of speakers comes with a manufacturer and date code. As well as a serial number so you can tell by the magnets these are two different types of speakers I'm guessing this number is the Baldwin part number a513 something and then down here is probably the manufacturer and date code serial number and this one I can't see any this might be the this is probably the manufacturer and date code. So we'd have to look this up. It's interesting that they used what seemed to be the same sort of speakers as far as overall dimensions and magnet size. This one has a square magnet, which I've never seen before. So there's a lot of interesting mysteries here. Now another piece of the puzzle for my theory that this is plate reverb is that this has a little bit of bringiness to it. Now over here on the Leslie unit we have what appears to be two speaker inputs with just wired there and if so you can imagine this being pulled out more or less intact and forming its own kind of mini Leslie unit, a true Leslie is, is much bigger than this. As a matter of fact, they talk about here they have rotor motor, remote control cabinet, remote tone cabinet. So this is designed to hook up, it appears with a Leslie speaker cabinet as an option so even though this is kind of a low-end home spinet organ, uh, you know, the, the high-end home person might still want a Leslie cabinet. Or it could be a practice organ for a serious musician who had a Leslie cabinet otherwise. So I've been taking the screws out of the uh, back panel to the Leslie area. I just noticed we have this vent hole right here which may have some sort of cooling ventilation or may even have an acoustic property that's important uh, for this box overall. You could think of this as sort of a base reflex type design maybe with a vent hole for that. So we're going to take out the last screw to see what's here. Oops, one more. One more. 
so we'll take out the last screw and see what's here in three, two, one, ta-da! So that's not unexpected. We've got probably eight or ten inch speaker here. Uh, wires that do appear to go to these posts that I found earlier. This is a, just a normal motor of some kind. It kind of reminds me of one from a tape recorder from this same era that I've seen. Probably an induction motor that runs at a fixed speed maybe. Here we can see the overall design. We've got the motor here turning a belt down in here through this slot which ultimately is going to run this cheese grater. The cheese grater is made entirely of wood. Oh, I see. There's a metal vein here, which kind of gives it structural support. Most of it is wood. Some sort of ball bearings or something down below. Um, and, of course, a few free cobwebs. So what I can kind of envision from a salvage point of view is basically unscrewing and or possibly even just cutting this whole thing out. The wood here is probably unnecessarily heavy so we might start with cutting it out and possibly uh, or removing it gracefully and adding on new panels to go with it. I'm not really committed to saving this uh, the overall chassis I guess you could say because uh, it doesn't have any reuse value. Um, it might be a source of kind of high quality scrap wood for other projects. That's kind of what I'm seeing it as. So. So there's our Leslie speaker assembly. Well, here it is later in the evening. I had to go to artificial light using my soft light that I did in another video. I've just about got the last screw off of this. It turns out that the captive nuts were held with a, what we would call nowadays glip. I don't know what they called it in 1960 or whenever this was made. Still haven't determined the date yet. I realized after my last shot that it didn't make sense for this to be plate reverb because plate reverbs are very large. And so turns out this is only a cover for Spring reverb. This is different from normal spring reverb because usually those are stored in a horizontal position. So this may rely on gravity for for the reverb effect to some extent. You can see the springs are stretched out at the top and not so much at the bottom. Um, in fact, we can even hear. Kind of a gunshot noise just from hitting the springs themselves. See, they're also balanced up here. So, that'll be more to figure out later. They're even suspended by small springs up here. Here's the inside of the spring reverb cover. This is tape, insulating tape that's been decayed over 50 years or something, so that's what we're up against. When I was a kid growing up with tube televisions, the first line of defense when something didn't work quite right was to um, test the tubes, which is something you could do at home using the tube tester at the local drugstore, which would also sell you common tubes. Uh, in this case, I don't have a drugstore with a tube tester, but I do have a tube tester. So we're going to look at that. 
And while we're here, let's get a good shot of this. This says delay line, delay line, input, output, input, output. Looks like this is two channels of amplifiers. We've got probably one that goes to the spring reverb and maybe another one that goes to this uh, this bank of capacitors. I'm not sure. I'll have to figure that out. Based on what I know about power amplifiers, I can tell a little bit of what's going on here. I've got 12AX7, which is a dual triode. Another one here. We have two pairs here of 6BQ5, which are power output tubes. This is the rectifier tube back here. We've got two 12AX7s again, and 6BQ fives again so I think what's happening here is we've got two power channels maybe one for each of these big speakers and here we've got a third power channel for the Leslie speaker probably now this board also has 12 AX 7s on it and from a salvage point of view those are worth about five dollars each if in good working condition um, so like right on the face of it I've got eight of these to work with there's forty dollars that's more than I paid for the whole unit so basically just pulling the tubes out of this thing and and testing them a little bit of effort but you could more than pay for the unit here now it looks like the bottoms of these spring reverbs have come off and they go to something have to figure that out at some point. Now on second thought I just noticed something going on here. This is the power transformer to go with the rectifier tube. Two audio amplifiers always have an output transformer. So this large transformer here I believe is the output transformer but I see now that these two speakers are ganged together so 8 ohms in parallel would work out to be 4 ohms driven by a single speaker. And these may be different as far as having different audio responses so that together they make a sort of a match pair that covers the whole frequency range properly. This transformer must be the output transformer for the Leslie uh, speaker. There's nothing in the way of an output transformer in this area here. Sometimes these output transformers are kind of attached directly to the speaker. That's not the case here. Now another thing I just noticed, this amplifier seems to be set up in kind of an add-on situation. Mechanically, since this is a separate unit that runs from, except from the same uh, high voltage DC supply created over here. Let's say that the Leslie unit was an option that, that might not have been in the organ at all and a different model or maybe um, an upgrade to this model. Uh, then we could have just ended the amplifier right here probably with some sort of a metal plate there. Maybe they use the same basic design in most of their organs. I've got a lot of these 6BQ5s in my stock. They're not super high power. Um, nowadays they don't seem to be much used. People either use the 6L6s for the larger amplifiers or 6V6s. I think all of the classic guitar amplifier designs used use those type of tubes. So these are I'm guessing are kind of in the middle range of power level. You can imagine that an amplifier for an organ like this probably doesn't need a whole lot of power in terms of audio power because if we really want to have a lot of audio power like say in a church setting uh, we can just plug in the remote tone cabinet which not only provides a better Leslie effect but uh, 
In particular, it's a large unit with big speakers and its own power amplifier. So I can kind of see this, the market here being either the home market exactly as is, or maybe a kind of a low-end church market where uh, you would add on the Leslie speaker. And this isn't really as full-featured as a church organ would typically be, but you know, if you had a small church, this might make sense. When I first tried to play this when it was still in the van, I immediately found out that the panoramic tone, as they call it, didn't work well. This is the off position and maybe low and high. So uh, you don't really know what panoramic tone really means, and uh, you know it's a marketing buzzword, but. I think that maps to the spring reverb over here. And one problem I can see with the spring reverb that I don't think I introduced is that these little hold down springs, which are very flimsy, are broken. So these are supposed to be held under some sort of nominal tension like that. And we can actually fix that pretty easily just by putting in some real lightweight springs down here. Now up here, it's interesting, I just noticed there's suspending springs up here and I believe this board contains transducers and the way spring reverb works is you've got something that creates a sound at one end it travels through the spring mechanically, bounces around, and then comes back out the other end. So for each pair here, you would have, let's say this is the input and this is the output. As Just picking one. And I'm thinking that the low setting is probably one pair of springs, and the high setting, they're combined in some way like Maybe they're in series where the output of this one goes to the input of that one or something like that. So we may be able to figure that out later. Now I haven't powered this up since I got the back off of it. Let's do that real quick and I'll test some of the features again knowing more about it. Um, I think in retrospect even though I originally thought the Leslie was bad, it, I think it's probably okay. I've just plugged it back in, haven't turned it on yet, but as a safety warning, if you do this kind of thing, I've been working with it completely unplugged since I took the back off. This is, has a two-wire cord on it. It's not uh, earth-grounded with a three-wire cord, and so there could be some exposed voltages in here, probably not by design, but by accident. Uh, I haven't worried about high voltage on the tube amplifier with it turned off because those are all available from underneath the body of the amplifier. So that isn't a shock hazard from the stored voltage in the capacitors assuming it's unplugged. But uh, it's something to be aware of now that I've got it plugged in. So let's flip the switch on this side and watch the tubes glow, which is always a lovely thing if you're a tube guy. Now if tubes don't glow, that usually means they're dead, but they could also be dead while they glow. So nominally speaking, they all are glowing. Hearing hum come out of the Leslie speaker. Usually hum in a tube amplifier relates to that the capacitors have gone bad. And since this appears to have the original capacitors, when we look at the amplifier, the first thing we're going to do is uh, think about changing the capacitors. And we're also getting a little crackling over here. But I should have enough Now I'm going to turn on the Leslie using this switch provided right here. 
and our cheese wheel comes to life. So that seems to be working fine on a mechanical basis. Looks like the problems lie in the amplifier, which I believe are, is this section. Crackling and poppling. That's not good. Now another problem I noticed with this before, seems like the lower rank is very quiet. I don't know how they've got things distributed there as far as the separation of the lower and the upper. It smells a little toasty, but that isn't really unexpected because you put heat and dust together and that's what you get. Here's my handy tube tester. Bought this at a ham fest a few years ago for about $25. It's very much on the low end of tube testers, but uh, I've had good luck with it. You can get the the kind of gold standard tube testers on eBay calibrated for like I think it's six hundred dollars uh, but this has been a good value for what it is it at least warms up the tubes and shows you whether they're good or bad in a general sense without giving you the numerical readouts of gain that you would get from the other type First I'm going to be testing the 12x7 tube since we have um, a lot of those. That's a 12 volt filament high gain tube that's often used in preamps. That's a dual triode that basically has two high gain elements inside. Okay, we'll test our first 12x7 tube. Already set up the tube tester and turned it on. Takes a second for the filament to warm up on the tube. So after the tube's warmed up on this one, push this button, wait for the needle to stabilize. So we're in the good range. Now since there's two elements per tube, two gain sections basically, we have to change the settings for the other section in this case G2 and K3 so this is G2 and K3 tubes already warmed up so we can just switch to that immediately okay so I'll repeat this procedure with all the 12 AX7 tubes in the unit to see uh, if any are bad and let you know if I find any well, I've tested all the 12AX7s in the main amplifier. I haven't tested the ones that go in the vibrato section yet. But for comparison, we're going to try that out. This is just a note with no vibrato. Here's what they call light vibrato. Whoops. Here's full vibrato. Here's the light. Can't really even hear anything on that. I can do both at once. So something doesn't seem quite right in the vibrato section. Uh, I'll test the tubes on that since they're 12 AX7s again, but uh, you know, maybe wiring or some other problem. As a quick aside, here's something that may have seemed safe in the 60s, but isn't today, or at least doesn't seem safe today. We've got a two-wire cord going to this tube tester. We've got a two-wire cord going to the organ. We've got metal exposed on the tube tester. Some metal exposed on the organ. And what could potentially happen is these are unpolarized two-prong plugs on the tube tester and the organ. You could potentially have those set up accidentally such that hot 
was on this metal if this had a fault inside it and ground let's say was on this metal you get between them now you've got a shock hazard so I didn't realize until recently that uh, such things needed a three-prong plug but they do and the tube tester I need to rewire for that and the uh, organ I'll be doing that at some point also but a simple solution right now is just plain to unplug the one I'm not using here are the last four tubes I've tested them all they all read the same value on both sections which is uh, 60 on this scale basically under the G so that's uh, in the good range also all of the 12AX7 tubes that I've tested are Baldwin brand which usually means that they've never been replaced sometimes things like this got light duty and didn't uh, the tubes never burned out as compared to uh, you know the television set might run for daily for hours and years and the tubes would inevitably burn out at some point you'd have to replace them or one or two here and there well I've plugged the tubes back in plug the organ in we're gonna let it warm up see if anything changed now since the tubes were good uh, I don't expect that to solve any problems except that sometimes reseating the tube in itself helps still hearing crackling out of the Leslie side let's try our vibrato settings again seems to work as before vibrato relies on a delay line using capacitors and maybe some of the capacitors have gone bad which might be why this light vibrato doesn't seem to do anything or maybe it's a uh, problem with the switch that's just speculation I uh, don't really plan to fix it but it might be fun to at least figure out what went wrong with it at some point now that all our 12AX7 tubes have been tested, I'm going to test the 6BQ5, which are the power output tubes. So I've got my tube tester set up for that. We'll just do one here to show you what that's all about. Similar process. Wait for it to warm up. I've already preset the settings on the tester here. Press the quality button and this one's showing good but at the low end of the range about 50 on the numerical scale um, looks like it's still warming up the needle tends to go more towards good as they warm up and then it kind of stabilizes at some point the other ones were showing 60 but that's a different uh, type so kind of we'll see if these show similar values uh, to each other the six BQ5 tubes here's something kind of fun I just realized that the uh, black keys of an organ make a pretty good temporary tube holder so at this point I've cleaned and test all of the tubes in both amplifiers except for the rectifier tube which is this large one here we know that works because the amplifier is uh, basically working nothing would work without that I've done also a little bit of light cleanup on this so you can see the numbers better I cleaned the tubes on the outside and with a real light cleaning to get some of the dust and grime off of those um, that isn't really necessary but it seems like something you should do every 50 or 60 years so we'll try it out again for the sound I think the sound is probably going to be unchanged but it's possible that reseeding the tubes in their sockets has done some good uh, particularly I had that crackly part on the uh, Leslie speaker over here
crackling seems to be gone. That might be a good thing. Don't anybody tell Google what song I just stole. Guess I'll try the panoramic tone again, although I know that that's not worth much at this point because the springs in the reverb aren't held down. Well, at least it doesn't make a nasty noise anymore. I've never been able to get the foot pedals on this to do anything. So that section of the tone generator is probably has some sort of major problem. Now another thing that I've tried here, I haven't been able to find much documentation on this organ. There's a pot here that looks like it's supposed to tune something and it's in such a prominent position that it makes me think it's either an overall frequency adjustment or maybe some sort of overall volume adjustment that's intended to be serviced through this top lid but I fiddled with that earlier and didn't come up with anything here's the uh, ID plate on the organ it's model 54A about 225 watts Lots of patent numbers, bald one, UL, serial number. I haven't been able to find a bald one serial number reference online, so the actual year of manufacturing of this organ is a little bit of a mystery still. The speakers might have been used as a clue for that, but it turns out they only seem to have a single year on them, like the last digit of a decade, so I don't know what the decade is. My guess is this is probably vintage, um, you know, 1960 to 65, but that's purely a guess. Well, we've reached the point where I'm going to start taking this apart. It's actually uh, nicely designed in different modules that come apart easily. It seems to have been designed well and from a servicing standpoint. Um, it's a nice piece of furniture aside from a few dings but the tone generator has some major problems and the fact that it's uh, you know quite obsolete as far as a musical instrument goes um, there's really no case to be made for keeping this together they're not valuable they're not collectible they're not rare and uh, much as I kind of hate to do this because in a way it seems like a thing of beauty to me, um, that's really what the next logical step is.